let's move into our first guest here, which is continuing on the topic, of course, that is is we're on now, and that is the ongoing slaughter happening in Palestine, of course, in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. And we are very honored to be joined here as we start the show by Miriam Bargudi, who's a journalist and policy analyst based in Ramallah. Miriam, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Well, it's uh, really happy to have you. And, uh, you know, I, I think that Obviously, there's so much focus on what's happening in Gaza, but there it seems to be a steady escalation as well in the West Bank of, of a whole range of activities from arrest to assassination. So uh, maybe you could just give us a capsule view uh, from, from where you're sitting of, of what's happening there in, in the West Bank and what Palestinians are facing. So in the West Bank, we're seeing a similar trend as in Gaza, and that's an escalation and emboldenment um, of Israeli settler violence just because the settlers that are throwing the bombs on Gaza are in uniform does not make them separate or exclusive from the settlers around the West Bank, forcibly expelling Palestinians from their homes at gunpoint, quite literally at gunpoint, and through um, the reinforcement and support of one of the most technologically advanced militaries in the world. We're seeing an increase of killing of Palestinians and again, most like in Gaza, most are minors and children. And you'll see the type of targeted precision kill shots um, across the bodies of the Palestinians that are being slaughtered in the West Bank. It's very similar to Gaza, targeted and precision. It's shots to the head. It is shots to the chest. That is, if you go through the autopsy list, it is chest, head, chest, head, chest, head. And these, again, are minors, unarmed civilians, non-combatants. Uh, and like Gaza, Israel is using the same slogan that they are targeting Hamas. And they're reaching levels of just last night, or rather today at dawn hours, the Israeli military invaded Ramallah, um, carried out large mass scale military incursions in different villages and cities and towns. And you need to remember the West Bank has been demilitarized since the 1990s under the Oslo Agreement. Um, so every piece of weapon that is in the West Bank is accounted for by Israel. So to even claim the Hamas argument goes to show you how this is um, an attempt at justifying the slaughter of Palestinians with the aim of expelling them. We are seeing new outposts, new settlements being built, even in the middle of a war. When Israel is $8 billion in debt, they just allocated 2.3 million Israeli shekels, um, which is almost the equivalent of a couple, uh, not a couple, close to $600,000, $700,000 to the yeshivot in Hebron for the Israeli settlements in the middle of war when it is under debt. So you can see where they're prioritizing it as well. We're just seeing mass expulsion. Miriam, I'm curious, you know, there was a lot uh, made about the fact that I think it was like yesterday or a couple days ago, the Biden administration announced that they were going to impose visa bans on settlers who were attacking Palestinians. And I'm curious your response to this. Is this actually anything that matters? Is it just something symbolic? I mean, obviously, there's a lot more the U.S. could do here. The U.S. claims to try to be um, non and a legitimate mediator uh, in, in Palestinian affairs, for that matter. But it is really just trying to butt rest and reinforce Israel's dominance in the region. We have seen it with its continuous... You can't say um, that you will not give a visa to someone that has attacked Palestinians when you are the number one state arming um, the Israeli military, when you have U.S. forces on the ground, actively participating in an ongoing genocide. So to claim that you are a legitimate um, and fair and just mediator goes to show you how the U.S. is trying to play the fields in an attempt, again, to showcase itself as the police of the world, as the only democracy in the world. And this is really criminal because what it is doing, in essence, is also privatizing um, weapons uh, development companies that are Israeli, that are national Israeli companies, but they're privatizing them more and more in the United States right now. So you can't just give a policy and expect it to be enough 
in, in regards of the relationship of how much you are part of committing the genocide. You know, one of the things I was hoping you could also help explain to our viewers is is the issues around the, you know, I would say massive restrictions on freedom of movement for Palestinians, you know, in the West Bank. I mean, I know it's accelerated in the context uh, of, of what's been happening since October 7th, but, you know, it's also a constant reality, which sadly some people in the United States are trying to deny even exists. I think the attempt to deny what is happening in Palestine is a signal of people's inability to sit with that discomfort mm. that a genocide is happening under their watch and that they have a role in it. I think the easiest way to deny that rather than confront it and challenge it, ask yourself what you can do about it and then set yourself up for failure to recognize that you might not overcome it, but that's not enough reason to ignore that it is happening. Um, and to, to not participate in it actively and willfully. But I think that's also part of how the media, again, is engaging with audiences, especially in the US. I think media thinks that their audiences are either stupid or ignorant or both. Um, and so they do not feed them with the right information. They don't give them the truth. Instead, it is these little sound bites that are dictated by editorial policies that are formulated after excessive years of consistent lobbying at a personal level. Um, and, and, and that helps curate the narrative that Palestinians are terrorists. And it plays on American vulnerabilities Throughout, you know, after we have seen from 9-11, there was this constant buildup of vulnerability that is fed by Islamophobia. And right now, Israel is playing on these, again, memories of pain in order to further feed uh, these vulnerabilities with the American public. And that's how the media coverage is framing everything here. Oh, this is just a fight of good versus evil, the civilized versus the savage. Um, this is a fight to, you know, as Netanyahu, and I quote, said, of light against darkness. And, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's that thing that, I guess, pushes people more and more um, into the denialism aspect that's rooted in an inability to just get uncomfortable with what's happening. I'm also curious if you could talk a bit about the fact that people are fighting back. There is resistance in the West Bank. Obviously, like, this is one of the fronts that Israel is fighting, Gaza is being the biggest one. But Israel is pretty much trying to take out anybody who's standing in its way. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a bit about that aspect, because I think a lot of times, you know, people see this as like, Obviously, Israel is slaughtering civilians, but Palestinians do fight back. They protest, they resist, both nonviolently and with arms, which they have every right to. So can you, I guess, give us a bit of a breakdown of what's taking place in the West Bank on that front? Yeah. Um, uh, so in the West Bank, we have actually a rise in armed resistance in the last year and a half. And just last year, the Israeli military, in coordination with its intelligence units and police, launched Operation Break the Wave, which was a series of extrajudicial assassinations. So you need to understand that when I say armed groups, these are basically small um, battalions of four or five uh, youth, usually between the ages of 18 to 28, that manage to find either a gun or buy an outdated gun and they go against this nuclear army. Uh, mostly they come out from refugee camps like Gaza, which is 70% refugees, and it's a return. But there has been a complete delegitimization of these groups, recognizing that their weapons are absolutely no match at all to the Israeli military. And this is why Israel continuously targets civilians and non-combatants, because on the ground and strategically, um, at, at the level of land power, they have not really been able to break um, the growth of armed resistance. Instead, we saw it rise and we saw, you know, the growth of more organized and strategic forms of resistance. But Israel considers everything as terrorism. And right now we have armed resistance, but two years ago we did not. And still they put or a cultural institution on the terrorist list. They put NGOs that are documenting human rights violations on the terrorist list and then demanded that the European Union withdraw funding from these organizations. So it really shows you kind of also what Palestinians must navigate in not just surviving, but confronting. 
No, I, I think that's a, a very well taken point. And, you know, especially speaking of children and thinking about those who have been, you know, taken captive, those who are being arrested, this huge increase we're seeing in arrest. I mean, it seems that one of the things that has been, you know, revealed in some ways by those political prisoners have been released is, I mean, how for many young people and children, this constant criminalization is just a part of everyday life. Absolutely. Being born Palestinian is being born under the watch of Israel. From the moment you are just brought into this life, you are under the watch of Israel. Our IDs are issued by Israel. Our entry and exit as Palestinians is dictated by the Israeli authorities. Um, how much water we have per day is dictated by the Israeli authorities. So the children experience this kind of violence at the daily level just the inability to survive, the inability, you know, to have nutrition. Many Palestinian children have high rates of malnutrition. Do you recognize what that does to you as a child in developmental ages? Um, and then to experience that, that weakness in your body and then witness your father being beaten in front of you because an 18-year-old soldier in the Givati Brigade was bored at the checkpoint mm. um, in the West Bank. And this is becoming a reoccurring story. I personally covered um, at least a dozen in the last year stories of Palestinian fathers being killed point blank because a soldier got pissed off at his tone or a soldier felt irritated that the father didn't listen on his way to work or um, passing through just cities going to dinners. So the children are witnessing this in the background. What does this do to a future? What does this do to a generation? It either breeds a generation that refuses to succumb and acquiesce and resist, or it'll breed a generation that is completely stunted and in shock of the violence that they're unable to grow. You know, Miriam, you've been living in the West Bank for a very long time and covering this. I think you've probably seen, you know, different Israeli leadership administrations. I think we've witnessed the Israelis go from, obviously, they've always had a sort of, ex, you know, eliminationist mindset about Palestinians. But it seems like we've reached a new phase where you have very open genocidal rhetoric throughout the last few years. And now you see it being carried out very openly in Gaza and a lot of that being mimicked in smaller ways in the West Bank. And I'm just curious if you feel that difference on the ground. Because, it, you know, obviously it's always been very bad. It's always been settler colonial. But we're in a phase where it looks like an exterminationist mentality is unfolding before our eyes. Yes. So for this is not new. The genocidal statements is how the state of Israel was birthed in 1948. It was built on massacres. Although... You are accurate in recognizing that this is unlike anything before, that even the trends of violence have surpassed anything in Palestinian history from the Nekbe, from 1948, which is considered the epitome of the Palestinian um, condition and reality. But right now what we are seeing is it's not the genocidal statements. They had set the intentions in the last five years, and Palestinians appealed very loudly in 2021 in the uprising of unity and hope. They pled very loudly from all over Palestine, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship in Gaza and the West Bank, um, and those in the and Syrians in the occupied uh, Golan Heights came together in a mass protest, saying Israel is reaching levels that are unprecedented. We have mobs yelling death to Arabs. We have the police shooting us point blank. And 50 Palestinians killed wasn't enough. 60 Palestinians killed wasn't enough. And every year just kept going on the rise. And now Israel, we, we the Palestinians said they are testing your limits. It is clear that the words limit is beyond genocide. It's quite the... Mm quite the moment to be in, but we were very, very happy to have you help uh, come join us and illuminate some of these points more greatly. Miriam Barghouti, journalist and policy analyst based in Ramallah. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.